Okay, welcome back. Sorry about the wait. We had a little bit of uh, technical issues here. Um, so welcome to this third week of structured programming. Uh, last time we left our discussion on um, uh, nested classes. And so we're going to briefly continue that uh, and then get into interfaces and the Lambda expressions today. But before we do that, uh, just a little bit of, as usual, of admin stuff. Um, we now have two out of three um, class representatives uh, for Comp 1140, uh, Alex Boxall, and for Comp 6710, Xian Li. Um, the 1110 one is just, um, we're, we're just waiting for confirmation there. Uh, they will be added on the website uh, where you will be able to find their, um, all their details uh, if you want to uh, communicate with them. In terms of the labs, uh, just uh, confirming that we have one additional in-person lab available uh, on Mondays, so today from 2 to 4 p.m. in Hannah Neumann, uh, room 1.23. And you should have been able to uh, enroll in the lab by using my timetable. One additional um, note here on the labs, each time you go through the material of the lab and in general also for the assignment, uh, you should check for updates by doing an upstream pool. And uh, we, we, we keep updating things, so this is, this is very important so that you can access the actual code you're supposed to work with. Assignment one, this is just a reminder, uh, check the deadline. Uh, anyway, it's next week, uh, Monday next week at 5 p.m. Um, if you're unsure about it, uh, you can always make use of the one-on-one -on -one consultation sessions. Um, the tutors will supply feedback uh, on your assignment via the repository. So you will have to pull uh, uh, once the assignment is marked and that will, uh, will, um, will give you the feedback. And this uh, just a reminder as well that the assignment is uh, redeemable. Any questions on that? Okay, so just really quickly, we last time we left our discussion on nested classes, and we uh, discussed that there are two main kinds of nested classes. Uh, one are static nested classes, and these classes behave as if they were declared as well. And for that reason, they do not have access, uh, direct access to the instance fields of the um, uh, parent, or I should say, actually the enclosing uh, class. Inner classes, which uh, can be also called instance classes, uh, instead uh, they are declared without using the static attribute and therefore uh, they are just literally part of the uh, embedding class and have direct access to the instance fields and members of that enclosing class. And we started doing some examples um, in terms of coding, which I'm now going to go back to. So we left our discussion here, uh, showing a first way of dealing with um, classes which are somehow interdependent. And our example was this flooring class, which would represent, um, which would represent essentially a, a type of flooring and the state associated with that flooring. But we also wanted to tie this flooring class to a room class, to a room object actually, because the flooring was uh, intrinsically associated with our room. So we created also this room object, uh, which has a flooring object in there. And we talked about how to create a circular relationship between the two so that the room can access the flooring and the flooring can somehow refer back to the room um, and we had uh, this problem of a stack overflow when we were trying to use our two-string method, uh, which we solved by going back into the flooring class and directly calling 
uh, this uh, get name uh, uh, method of the rule case. What I haven't showed you is uh, additional two ways uh, of essentially solving the same problem uh, by using nested classes, uh, static nested classes, and instance uh, nested classes. So let's start from static nested. So we can create an additional class here, uh, which we're going to call uh, room static nested. And we can add it. And essentially, what I'm going to do now is literally to grab the code that we have at the moment in our um, existing room class, paste it there, and the difference is now we want our flooring class to be a static nested class within this new room class, okay? So to do that, um, we can go in flooring, just grab flooring, the content of it, or well, actually the whole class. And basically paste it in here. Okay, now we will have to fix a few things. Well, first of all, this is a static class. So we need to give it uh, the static attribute. Not a big deal. Then we can go down and we can see that as I put um, this, uh, this copy the code in, now IntelliJ has changed uh, the reference to the cluster that was using for cleanliness. It's referring back to the one uh, which is in the other flooring class, so we need to change that. Um, we need to change also the fact that we have a room here. Uh, this should be now a room static nested. Uh, same here. And same problem here. We are referring now to the, the cleanliness um, the enumerated type, which is defined within our static, uh, uh, static class. And so if we uh, keep going here, um, the constructor is OK now. Well, we need to change, of course, the constructor of the room. It has the wrong name at the moment. So that's room static nested. All seems fine here. And if we keep going, that, that all seems to work out. So basically, as you can see here, once I have put this class in, um, I mean, other than for minor issues with the, clearly with the, with the constructor names, uh, uh, method names, and uh, referring to the right um, classes, meaning the definition of the classes which are within the actual embedding class, this behaves as if it was um, uh, the flooring static uh, inner class, nested class behaves as if it was defined elsewhere. There's not much of a difference. So let's go uh, back here and uh, try it out. Let's call it room two. And new, that's going to be a room static nested. We've got to give it a name. Uh, let's call it lab. And it's going to have tiling. And let's start, try to print it out just to check that everything works out. Let's run this. And 
let's make this a little bit bigger so you can see that all went fine. Okay, now the other one is the uh, instance nested. So let's let's create that one. New class. In instance nested. Okay, great. And that's uh, again very simple here. Now we we've, we've done all the heavy lifting in terms of the code with the with the static nested. Uh, we just need to change uh, the kind of nesting uh, for our inner class. So what I'm going to do is to copy this stuff, put it here, and now I just need to be careful that I need to change. Um, this uh, to, uh, to simply being an instance class. Uh, of course, here I want to refer directly to that flooring, the one which we have defined in here. And, but now there are a couple of interesting things. Well, the first, again, stuff that we need to change, which is due to referring back to uh, different definitions of classes, but the point is that um, since we have this uh, flooring uh, instance class here, this is going to be used only internally in our um, instance room instance nested. So at this point, it doesn't really make sense to give the, um, the flooring a room at all. It is implicit that we are using the, that particular room, which is the instance nested room, and if we create an object that we are using that particular object for our flooring, right? So we don't need this. And so that means that for the flooring, we don't need to, to have a room for the constructor. Um, we do need the cleanliness state. So what do we do here now with room? Um, well, we can eliminate this. Right, we don't really need it. And then if we go here, where the problem is essentially, you know, every time we want, we want to have the name of the room, well, this is an inner class, uh, sorry, a, a, an inner instance class. And so what all we need to do is to access the name um, member field of room because we have access to it. So we don't, use, we don't need to use that, uh, that uh, method anymore. Constructor here, change the name of it. Instance nested. And then we, we now have changed, well, that's still the wrong one, but we have now changed the, this constructor to just take the string floor, and so we don't need uh, the this pointer or keyword. And it's pretty much about it, I believe. Um, so let's see whether this works. So let's create another room. Uh, car for sure and that's room instance nested I'm not sure what we want to call this uh, let's say whatever uh, y and it does timber do a sort and check whether this is working as intended. Okay, great. So again, in terms of uh, stepping a little bit back um, and reminding uh, you what, what's going on here, the main point is that having a, a static 
nested class is like taking that class and defining it elsewhere. And so you don't have access to the, to the inner fields of the encapsulating class while using um, the uh, defining the class as an instance nested uh, or simply as an inner class will give you access to those inner fields, which means that potentially you can simplify uh, the, um, the code and the structure of the inner class because you have access to those fields. But these are the main differences. Okay, this is all I wanted to say on this topic. Uh, let's could now go back uh, to our slides. And we will keep going with uh, another one of our uh, bios. Uh, this is Grace Hopper. Uh, she was a computer scientist, and curiously, um, she was also uh, a Navy admiral as well, which I found a pretty interesting combination. Um, she was a pioneer um, in programming and invented one of the first linkers. And she was also to devise uh, the theory behind uh, machine-independent programming languages. Uh, these are languages that could compile and run on different architectures, which this happens basically today all the time, but she was the first to devise the theory behind it. And her work in that area uh, was extended to, to and led to the creation of the COBOL programming language which is one of the early programming languages which is still in use today, I think mostly in finance applications, I think. Um, she coined the term bug, uh, or she is said to be have coined the term bug. Uh, what's interesting about this, uh, this um, bug is that uh, actually, you know, when we refer to a bug, this is typically a problem associated with, uh, nowadays, with, with our code, right? Uh, at that time, when she um, referred to this term, uh, this wasn't actually about code, but this was actually about a, an actual uh, moth uh, which was stuck in the relay and impeding the operation of the computer. Um, and so in that case, uh, it, an actual insect got in the machinery and uh, impeded the, 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 the functionality of, of the system. All right, so now we go back in our exploration of object-oriented programming, and we'll discuss uh, more in detail about interfaces. So we, we have had already um, seen a little bit of interfaces at a high level, as we usually do. Um, and when I present an interfaces, I mentioned that they provide a form of abstraction for a group of methods but they don't provide the implementation of those methods. Um, for this reason, interfaces, you can think of interfaces as a contract, meaning that a class that implements an interface uh, must provide the functionalities uh, which are within that interface. This translates to the fact that the class must implement the code um, uh, or provide the implementation of the methods which are uh, uh, declared within the interface. So how do we um, use interfaces? Um, so you, to define an interface, first of all, you must uh, use the interface keyword rather than the class keyword. Um, another important point is that since interfaces uh, do not define objects, and they don't have, well, I said there are a few exceptions, but essentially, in general, they don't have an implementation of any kind. They cannot be instantiated in all cases. You can instantiate an object. You can't instantiate an interface. Um, on top of that, um, what you can have in, in, in the interface are only constants which are variables which are declared with uh, using the, the final attribute, for example, or static uh, final attribute as well. Um, and uh, you can have the method signatures, so you can essentially declare the method with your signature, um, and you can have also some uh, nested classes. 
Java 8 allows also to provide a default method um, that you can implement uh, within your interface. So this method can be used um, as a default implementation for all the classes that implement that interface or can be overwritten uh, by the class uh, when uh, that class implements the interface uh, as well. So you choose. Um, in Java 8, we can also have static methods uh, uh, defined within the interface. Uh, these are exactly like default methods, uh, but they are shared among all classes using the same interface, but they cannot be overwritten. So if you declare, declare them as static, you can't override that method. So one of the key reasons uh, for having um, uh, for having interfaces is that uh, um, this goes a little bit, um, circumvents a little bit of the problem associated with Java, which is that you can have only, each class can have only one parent, right? So it provides an additional way to, um, uh, to provide functionalities that span across uh, uh, more classes. And uh, so, while you can have only one parent uh, for a class, you, a class can implement as many interfaces as, as they want, as you want as a programmer. Okay, this is uh, an interesting um, functionality within Java is that interfaces can be used as a type. So as for classes, uh, we can have variable that, that we, where we can have a variable that point to uh, an object which is of uh, belongs to a given subclass. We have seen the example of this uh, with, with our coding uh, session where we had a bunch of subclasses of the person class, but we could create an array of uh, the kind associated with the type person and in that array have objects uh, which also belong, uh, belonged to the student class in that particular case and the comp 1110 um, uh, class, right? So this is very similar. When in the interface, you can declare a variable of a type of that particular interface and use that to hold the reference to an object of any class that implements that interface. And we are going to go right now in the coding session to an example of this to make it more clear. Okay, mini quiz, let me release this. Two or three. I'll give you a minute to go through this. All right, so let's let's play a little bit with these interfaces. Uh, let's define an interface. The way to define an interface is to own Java class here, and instead that defining a class, we define an interface, and we are going to declare this interface um, 
give it the name toxic. So what is this interface supposed to do? Basically what, what we want here um, is this interface to represent the toxicity of various objects. It can be objects of any kind and all we want to know is whether these are, for example, toxic to human. Okay? So it's a very simple idea and if we look at it, uh, how do we define this? Uh, well, we can give it one method and let's say it's going to give us return a billion and this method we call it is lethal to human. And as for all interfaces, that ends there, meaning that we just have the declaration, then the classes which will implement that interface need to give the definition and override that method. Okay, so let's, um, let's say, for example, uh, we can create uh, a bunch of, of different classes. Uh, let's start with something that we call a brown snake. That's uh, clearly toxic. We can add this. And how do we use that interface? We need to implement it. So using the keyword implements toxic. Now you can see it's red because if you hover on it, um, the point here is that if you implement that interface, you must provide a definition for the method of the, uh, the declared in that interface. So let's do that. So we'll go here and say, um, actually probably can even generate it. Implement methods. There you go. Um, so if you ask it to implement it, it will override it. Uh, the only thing is that you might need to adjust it a little bit, depending on what you want the method to return. In this case, we don't want it to return false, so we want to return true. Okay. And let's now go uh, quickly through the definition of additional uh, classes. So let's say uh, one can be uh, hydrogen cyanide which is a little gas and go in there and let's ask also to implement this for us. Oh, well, I need to, uh, to implement it. Say that implements toxic. So that we go quickly through this. Uh, let's return true. And let's create the just last one, which is something that we can split. A little bit. So let's say something like chocolate. Implement toxic. And let's go with the generation. <clears throat> and this is fine uh, to return false. Uh, did I put two here? Yes. Okay, so now as usual, let's generate, let's create a class so we can run these things with Java class that we're going to call interfaces, interfaces. Add. And we want to have our main in there, main method. And let's define, let's uh, create a bunch of these objects that um, of the various classes that we have just discussed. So let's say bar snake, and that's going to be a new brown snake bar uh, gas. A new hydrogen cyanide object. 
and food chocolate okay now what do I want to show you here is that um, we have implemented this interface and then we, for each one of those we're going to go ahead and call uh, the particular implementation of, of that interface or actually the method which is within that interface which is this little to human but before we go there uh, what is an interesting um, feature of the interfaces as I said is that we can def define a variable of the type of that interface which is a reference to an object of a class that implements that interface um, so in practice, we can declare something as toxic, and let's say this could be toxic uh, snake, right? And we can set it to snake, and that's a completely legal uh, syntax, because because the brown snake class uh, implements that interface. So we can go beyond that, as we have done for inheritance, very similar uh, mechanism. Uh, we could have uh, an array of toxic things. So let's call them toxic things. And can we move toxic? And that's an array. And then we can put in there the snake, which is of a human class, the gas and the food they're all of different classes but they all implement uh, that interface and so what is great about this is that as i said it gives you a way somehow uh, to go around the problem of the single parent single child inheritance um, mechanism in java and of course if we use a for loop let's say and uh, loop over those things or uh, T toxic things and then we call um, print out from that let's print them or actually no that's not the interesting bit the interesting bit is to call the implementation specific implementation of that uh, interface for each one of the classes so I could say T gives me the the object itself uh, and let's print also um, the the um, the return value of the, the the method, the associated interface method. Okay, so let's run this. And as you can see, we get we get the usual uh, printout coming from the object superclass, which gives us uh, the list of packages, the name of the class, uh, and the dead hash code, which is an address essentially. And then it, it now also after that, we get the return value for each specific implementation of this little PD. Okay, great. Um, any questions on this? Very simple. Okay, in that case, we'll go back to the slides. To explore uh, a very different feature of, of Java, which is in many, I have to say, implemented in many other also object-oriented langu uh, uh, languages, uh, which are Lambda expressions. What are these lambda expressions? Lambda expressions give us uh, a way to pass code as a parameter, essentially just like we pass data. So, so far in methods, uh, in the method signature, you know, you have a bunch of arguments and you pass those uh, as parameters and so far those parameters have been only associated with data of some kind. It could be a primitive type, it could be, um, it could be a class type, so a complex type. Uh, but instead here, lambda expressions give us the ability to pass code as a parameter. 
if you want. So this uh, is extremely useful in event handling, which we will do and we'll see how to use Lambda expressions in event handling, uh, where we can pass to a method behavior based on the outcome of a given event. Uh, this is mostly, we, we, our experience with Lambda expressions and event handling will be mostly associated with JavaFX uh, when we'll get to talk about the GUI. Anyway, this how, what's the syntax of uh, Lambda expressions? Uh, you have a list of parameters. Uh, in this case, X is a parameter. Uh, those, if you have more than one parameter, you should put those parameter, parameters in parentheses and the list should be comma separated. If you have only one parameter, as you see below, you don't need the parentheses. Then we have this, uh, this right-hand uh, arrow, uh, which points to the code, uh, which is um, essentially the body of the lambda, so the implementation of, of uh, the lambda expression, which is code to be run. It's as essentially the equivalent of the body of a method. And so the example here, as you can see, x uh, is a parameter. Uh, we are pointing to this code and what the lambda expression is going to return uh, is uh, the return value of that logic expression. So if it, x is greater than 100, it's going to return true. Um, here we have um, a more complete kind of syntax. Um, where, uh, the, where, where the the actual code for the lambda um, is enclosed into braces, so it defines a block of code, and you have also an explicit return statement for the return value of, of the lambda. Now, the, the topic of lambda uh, express, expressions is uh, quite tied uh, to do that of functional interfaces. So what are these functional interfaces? In Java, uh, as uh, I mentioned at some point, uh, there are no actually real functions defined. We only talk about methods, although I've been using this word interchangeably, but in, in, formally in Java you have only methods, not functions, okay? Um, and it, a functional interface is a way to get around this problem again and say I have an interface which is uh, defining only a single method. So it becomes kind of equivalent to a function, right? Because it's, it's, it's like a wrapper around a single method. And um, typically the way to implement a functional interface is to use a lambda expression, and we will see an example soon. Um, so, the, there are many functional interfaces defined in Java. They are typically defined in this Java util function. Um, and uh, here we have two examples. One is a predicate uh, uh, example. Predicates are, um, are methods that get uh, a numerical value typically uh, in this case, it's an integer, and they return a Boolean. They do a test on, on that value. Uh, and then here, there is another example, which is an example of a supplier uh, functional interface. The suppliers supply things, uh, objects. In this case, this supplies uh, double precision, uh, double uh, floating point precision uh, primitive data types. There are also consumers that you feed them with something, they don't return anything. They just do some operations uh, on and process uh, object that you passed to them. Okay, next mini quiz. which is uh, clearly about lambdas.
All right. So if we're done with the quiz, what we're going to do now is to show a little bit when lambda expressions uh, are actually healthy okay, and how to use them as well. So let's uh, create a new class that we're going to call lambdas. And we're going to do all in this class. So let me also add directly a main in here. And let's say that we have uh, an array of integers. Uh, let's call it A. Oops. And let's create this object. So we have a high reasonable number of integers in there, let's say 50. Okay, and uh, we want also to initialize this uh, to something which is non-zero, otherwise all those elements, you already know this, will be zero in there. So let's do for, uh, let's do it with a for loop. And a I, let's set that value to the loop uh, iterator value. Okay. Um, so, once we have this uh, this array, let's say we want to do we want to implement a bunch of different functions that do different things on the elements of this particular array, or, or actually uh, the determine different, different things um, on, uh, based on the value of the elements of this array. For example, let's start with one um, member method which will tell us, uh, give us a list of all the elements uh, which are divisible by two for this particular array. So we go back here. And we write this as, let's say, a static method will do. Public static. Uh, it doesn't return anything. This prints out stuff, a list of values. And then let's call it print multiples and what's going to take? Well, it's going to take, of course, our array as an argument. How do we do this? Um, let's say for bar and oh, let's call it b value a. And then we want to print this only if the elements are dead element of the array is a multiple of two. How do we do this? Any idea of how to implement this? Yes? Yep, great, great idea. So we can use a modular operator. Um, so this is showing a very basic case where the modulo operator is quite helpful. So remember um, what that modulo operator does. So this this is going to return a zero if the um, the division by two doesn't have uh, the remainder is zero, right? And so so that's exactly checking whether that is divisible by two. So that's uh, what we want here. And let's say then we want to print this out, but since we want a list, so far we've been using this print line, which has uh, which has a new line of character at the end. There is also another uh, member method which is just print, and that will not have the return, uh, sorry, the new line uh, character at the end. So let's do this way so that we have a nice list here, and then we will put our um, new line only once at the end. Okay, so then we can go here and say 
um, print multiples of two. and run it. And uh, it kind of does the job. Um, so now we've written this, 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 uh, this method. And let's say we want to, to do a slight variation on the theme. Let's say that uh, we want to um, print out all the elements which are multiples of three or of four, right, of another number. So clearly one way to do this uh, would be um, to go back to this uh, method and we'll have um, another method called the print multiples of three, another one print multiples of four, uh, and so on and so forth. That is a really bad idea because uh, we are uh, we are writing a lot of so-called boilerplate code, um, which uh, you know it's going to 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 inflate the size of our code, which we don't want. We don't, we, we would like to reuse as much as possible uh, the methods that that we create. On top of that, if you do that, you you're going potentially to do this operation, which is grab this method and copy and paste it. And if you have a bug in there and keep copying and pasting, you're going to spread the bug uh, all over your code. So one way is then to use uh, parameterization um, as a way to define a more general method here to achieve that goal. So let's say, for example, we could do something like this. and call our method print multiples of. And then and now we're going to give it a divisor. Uh, let's say int divisor. And so here we don't need the two anymore. We are passing it as a parameter and this is more general, okay? That's basically a goal achieved. Now let's say we can give it three and run the oops, what's going on? Okay. And that is fine as well, and it's more general. Now let's say we want to go even beyond this, and somehow we are going to define uh, a method which does something um, different enough that, that the code internal to the method is um, uh, as, as some pieces which overlap with what we've been doing so far and some other than don't. For example, let's say I want to print all out all the elements of the array which are square numbers, okay? So let's go back here and define that uh, method. So let's do a public set of void. And let's call this print squared. squared. And this is just going to get our array. And how do we do this? Um, well, clearly we want to loop over the array elements. R, D, A. And any ideas here? So we want to bring out one of the elements, and the value of one of the elements, if it's a square. Yes? 
is less than yeah yeah sure it has to be less than uh, than if if one of the elements already within that array is uh, is a square number. That's getting much more, well, not much more, but a little bit more complicated than before, right? So let, let's see. For example, one potentially inefficient way of doing this is to add another for loop. And uh, let's have that for loop go up to the current uh, uh, element. So I say less than or equal to b, which works because b is an integer. And then what we're going to do if i times i, which by definition is square number, um, equals b, we can print that out. Everything clear here? That's not what I want. And also I don't want to use this one. What I want is um, something like this. And then we can pre uh, put our, our usual S out at the end. Okay, so let's just check quickly whether this works. Print squares. Okay, and that, that's fine. Um, not probably the most efficient way of doing it. But now the point that I want to get across quickly is um, if we wanted to have now a method that has all these three uh, functionalities in one, it's getting a little bit more complicated, right, than, than before. So we can't easily use parameterization to achieve this goal. So that's where uh, lambdas uh, come in handy. So uh, you'll see in here that, for example, we have the pieces, the common piece of, of code that we have is this for loop. Right, and then there is stuff within this for loop which includes other loops, potentially other code which is associated with logic assertions and so on. And so that is the code that we would like to pass to this method uh, uh, by using a lambda uh, expression. So how do we do this? Um, the first thing to do is uh, to remember that uh, we have um, some um, functional interfaces defined already. One that we have seen before is essentially uh, the one uh, that has the test method in there, which is an integer uh, predicate, which takes an integer and returns, uh, returns uh, a Boolean value. And we can actually reuse uh, that one. So let's say that we define this as public. It can be static. And it's void as well. We are interested in printing stuff. And let's call it print when. And now. Uh, what do we pass here? Well, clearly our array, right? but we want also to pass the code. And that's entirely the point. So we want to have a method that grabs this code uh, and, and uses that so that we can change the functionality um, when we could call this method with a lambda uh, expression. 
And so the way to do this is to pass an integer predicate, which is defined. And well, now what you haven't seen is that, of course, IntelliJ has gone to the place where the definition is. Um, and uh, let's call it there and what's a, what's the general way of achieving this well uh, as I mentioned before we have this bit of the code uh, which is um, which is common and then we can put our predicate here if let's say pred dot test we pass the integer value there b so we have to do the test that we are going to do is not defined here, right? So we will need to implement that through a lambda. Uh, the implementation will happen through a lambda expression. And uh, so if that happens um, based on what, what is the kind of task that we want to perform, um, we can uh, print out our V. And then we can add also here uh, an S out at the end. OK, so that's the, the first portion. Uh, now we need to actually use this. Right? So let's go back here. How do we use it? Well, we provide the implementation of test. Uh, print when here. We pass A. And now we provide the implementation, the code that we want to run which is essentially test, right? So since this is a functional interface, it operates as a wrapper around a single, uh, a single method. All we need to provide that is, is essentially the, that method. And we can do it easily this way using lambdas. That's our parameter. X, let's say that's the first case that we had, right? And we can say zero. That's that's our first one. Then we can have the other one. No additional parameters needed. And the most, uh, the, the the one which is more complicated here. Well, here we can't get away just with just uh, this little bit of code. We need to provide a little bit more. And what do we need to provide there is essentially what was the inner loop that we had. So that's four uh, and I zero I less or equal to X I plus X here. And there is another difference here. So let's say we, we, we of course, we keep this logic here. But instead of doing the printing, because the printing is going to be done by uh, the, um, the member um, method that we just defined uh, up in the code, uh, we just return true. And of course, we can't stop there because um, this is an if statement, so we might fail that. So we need to have a default to return value, which can be false. OK, so let's try to run this. And as you can see, we get all, uh, everything matching nicely. Uh, so again, what I want to clarify here, which might be confusing, is this notation. In this case, x is, uh, um, if we go back to, where did I put it? Here. Uh, x is, is our uh, uh, variable d in this case. Okay? It's the argument of uh, the parameter that we are passing to the method within the functional interface. OK, so um, if we wanted to do something different in terms of having a different uh, functionality for the predicate, we could define our own functional interface that anyway, it's, it's pretty uh, easy to do. 
Um, let's let's just um, look a little bit into that. Uh, we we are now going to implement quickly uh, a, a new functional interface uh, that um, it's going to um, what it's going to do is uh, let's say we want to have a, f a functional interface with a method in there that takes two numbers, um, uh, sums them, and converts them into another numerical type. So let's say it takes two integers, sums them, and converts them into a double. So what's it going to be uh, the, uh, the, the signature or the code here for this interface? Let's put it down here, it's better. Um, it's, it's, it's an interface, so we need to define it as an interface. Um, and then let's say double from int. Oh, we'll copy this there because it's an interface. And we need to provide a single method in there. We said it's going to return a double. And the, the signature of this, uh, of this method, uh, let's say call it convert, um, is that it has taken, it takes two integers, int a and int b. That's pretty much about it. That's to define your own functional interface. Uh, now let's see how do we use this. Let's go down here. And let's copy the bullet, double from int. And let's call it my lambda. Now, again, you can also use this equal, you can assign that functional uh, interface to the lambda itself because the functional interface is just a wrapper around a single method. So it's like assigning the body or the implementation of a method, which is in this case is convert. So we, what we got to match here is the syntax of the convert method within that functional interface. And that's essentially this double. And we can sum, let's say, you can do anything with those, but um, let's say x plus y. Okay. And then we can use it. And let's say my lambda dot convert and you can provide two values in there. So let's run this. And that is all fine. Okay, so now it's, it's given us a double. Now, one important thing, which is the last feature that I want to show you about lambdas is uh, with, yes? I cannot hear well you. It's the name, it's the name of the interface, right? So this, uh, I have defined an interface. So as you can see here, it's like a class, as I said before, instead of class you use interface. It's just a special interface, it's a functional interface, which simply means it has a single, a single method. And that is the key. That is why you can use that notation, because it's a wrapper around a single method. Um, the name, my lambda, of course, that's just a name of like a variable that, that is, that's arbitrary. Okay, so what I wanted to show you is that um, there's, there's an even more uh, powerful feature of lambda. So, so let's say that I define uh, a variable uh, which is an array with two integers, just to match those two x and y there. Lambdas have the capability of capturing information from the uh, embedding scope. And in particular, they can capture values and variables and their values from the embedding scope. So let's say I do double from int and let's, let's define another one of this. And then I, I can provide a very similar, um, let's say, uh, signature here. 
but um, let's do something additional. So on top of returning those two, let's return that. What I want to do is to capture values from C and set them. C, you will. And, you know, what I can set them, for example, to X. And C1, I can set it to Y. And let's say, well, I need a semicolon here, because that's a definition. Um, and then let's do this. Let's um, print out the Um, yes, uh, from arrays, so this is a method to, to string that will give us uh, a nice uh, printout of our array, which is C. Uh, before we use the lambda, then we can use uh, the lambda, my capture, let's put three of them here, um, where we don't need this, my capture, and then we call it convert. And to make it different from the other one, let's do 11 and um, 12, okay? And then we print uh, those out as well. And let's run this. So as you can see, What's going on there is that it has captured those values, it has set them, and I mean, it's at the same time, it's super powerful, but if I look at the code here and imagine that my capture was defined somewhere else, and look also at these three lines, there is no way for me to know that those values in the array, which was defined in the same scope, are actually getting changed. So it's a very super, it's, it's a very powerful feature, but it's very dangerous in terms of creating bugs that are very difficult to find. Okay, great. Um, any questions so far? Not that I, that I can see. Um, so let's keep going and last topic for today we are going to go a little bit more um, in detail on inheritance and things that we are, have already essentially discussed all right so um, as we already know we can uh, um, we can create uh, subclasses from a given from a given parent class um, uh, this inherit some of the fields and of the methods defined in the in the parent they're called the sum classes or derived class or child while the super class is called as you can see there super class base class or parent class in order to um, use inheritance we use this extends uh, keyword um, which enable us to define a child class from uh, a parent that we are extending there is also a bunch of um, uh, 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 methods uh, which are defined in the object class, and we have di we have discussed also that the object class is the superclass of all classes, from all from which all of them automatically inherit uh, 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 from. So they are all extending object. Overriding methods, um, for instance methods, um, for instance methods, if the method has the same signature of its superclass, um, it said to override uh, the parent's method. And we mark this uh, with the override annotation. Important thing, for, for overriding, you need to have the same name, the same number and type of parameters, so the same signature of the method, and um, the same return type. 
Uh, one important thing that we, we kind of discussed a little bit is that the type of the instance determines the method that which is getting called, okay? So you create an object which is of a given instance in, in our example with parent, student, and student, for example. You create a, an, an object of the kind of student, uh, then I'm going to call a method which is um, implementing the student. If there is th that method is not implemented in student, then it's going to call the parent one. Uh, class methods, instead of overriding, they are said to hide the superclass method. Um, and so this is because uh, in practice, when you uh, uh, define class methods and when you use class methods, you should always use the name of the class and not of the instance. And so there is not much of an ambiguity there because if you want to call a, 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 a class method, you will always have the class name first dot the, the name of the method. Polymorphism, uh, so this is the ability of an object uh, to belong to different uh, classes at the same time in Java Just 2. Um, and we can, well, well actually that's not true, uh, to different classes at the same time. Uh, we can have, as we've seen, uh, last time we defined uh, a student and comp 11 10 student, which were um, uh, essentially subclasses, all stemming from person, which was the superclass. But we could create an array of uh, objects, which were all of the same kind, which was the kind person. And so this is this is kind of shows this polymorphic uh, ability of representing um, uh, objects. Now, once again, I pointed this out already earlier, the method that is getting called it depends on the type of the instance, not on the type of the reference variables. So we have seen this explicitly, and hopefully if we have the time today, we'll see this again, um, uh, what this means. Hiding fields. Um, is possible also to hide the fields on top of hiding uh, methods. Um, in general, you don't want to be doing this. This is very confusing, right? Because if in your in your parent you have uh, named the fields in a certain way, you want to have those fields to be identifiable unambiguously as fields of the parent. So do not use the same name for uh, for for fields which are within 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 a child, uh, because that will hide them, but typically will just um, uh, generate bugs because it's not an intended uh, kind of behavior. The super keyword again quickly we have seen this. Uh, this allows you to refer back to the parent to call its constructor to access their fields, and to access uh, the, the, um, the methods of the parent. Yes, so I think we have seen examples of all of this. Okay, another mini quiz, the last one of today. And then we'll go just through a quick example of code to remind us of inheritance and putting together also in the cases.
it's going to be oh four. All right, so here this is going to be a bunch of simple examples to that will give, give us the opportunity to remember things and to to clarify some some details. So let's say that we have um, uh, we want to create a class called animal, which is this super class which represents all animals, and then we are going to specialize this class so so, so to create additional uh, children. Um, of, 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 of animal. And so let's say, for example, dragons. Animal. And let's say here we have a protected string, which is the name. So we give access to the, to the child to the name. And then we need a constructor. Let's quickly generate that. Done. Um, let's uh, say Okay, so let's let's uh, let's show something which is interesting. Um, so let's generate uh, the two string, and this is this is the usual two string method. But w w one one of the um, uh, the interesting thing that you can do is to call, as I said before, all objects inherit uh, from the object class, right? So let's say we modify this class uh, by and and we print out the name of this animal, um, and then let's say uh, we want to also um, we want to also s out the specific class of that uh, uh, that it, or, or the specific class of this object that we are going when we are going to call the two string method, and so the way to do this is to use the this get class uh, method so the get class method is essentially will give you um, a printout um, which um, uh, will contain a long name for that class so it will include the name of the packages plus the name of the class if you want to extract just the name of the class uh, you can keep going and ask to get simple name and i'll show you what this does Okay, let's um, let's just uh, quickly run these things. Several name. That's not what I wanted to call this class actually. Refactor name. That's inheritance. Okay, quickly. Let's create a um, an animal here, um, and food animal. Let's call it Steve, and let's. Let's out that. I want to show you a little bit what's going to happen there. So the point is that it's going to give you a clear, clean name of that particular um, uh, class, and you can play with that and and see also what happens if you just call the first one. I want to proceed a relatively uh, in, a, in a relatively more way here because I want to get to the important features that I want to show so let's say we create another class we call it mammal add it 
Um, and this thing is not going to do much other than having a constructor as well. Oh, this needs to extend uh, animal. Extends animal. Uh, let's generate the constructor. And um, let's um, also override the two string method union. And uh, well, actually, that's not what I want. What I want is just to print that out. No other information. And then let's say that uh, we create uh, another another class which extends animal. Uh, that's a reptile. Reptile. Uh, also, this one. We'll keep it extremely simple. Extends and let's say public. Well, let's generate it. Extends animal. And then let's keep going so that we get to the point. Uh, we'll get another two classes, one extending reptile and one extending mammal. So let's say human extends mammal. mammal. And uh, what do we give it? Uh, let's say Yes, our constructor, easy, and uh, we give it also, um, well, actually, n not n nothing else for the moment. And then let's create a snake, which extends um, reptile. Okay. And also this one, very simple. Okay, so now let's go back in our inheritance here. And so let's, let's show a couple of things. So the first thing to do here is that uh, we want to um, have a bunch of these things. Uh, so let's say one is, um, let's call it Jess, is a human. Yes, and then we have um, so the Jeff is a snake. Snake. Jeff. Okay. And so, uh, well, the first thing to do here is to see what they are printing out, right? when we use this out system out. Well, actually, when we use print, that's the method. Yes. And, yeah. and this is to show the inheritance behavior, right? So animal is printing animal. Um, the human who is Jess is printing mammal. Why is it printing mammal? Because in human, we haven't overridden the two string method, so it's printing, it's, it's using the one of the parent. And uh, uh, Jeff instead is, is printing, uh, Jeff is a snake, uh, because that actually is the implementation directly up to the top of animal. This animal is defining two string, and in the, the two string uh, method is getting the class and the simple name of the class. Okay, cool. So um, quickly, uh, a few interest additional things. As we said before, uh, you can um, 
let's create um, an array of these things. So since they are all animals, animal, animals, uh, you can do this. Um, uh, you can create references um, to uh, to these objects uh, by using their uh, um, parent or super, any of the superclasses. In this case, animal. And this is essentially the equivalent example of what we have done with students. Snake, and that's not snake, that's Jeff, which is a snake. And well, on top of what we had done last time, uh, we know already that we can look over this, um, all of these objects. And uh, we can print stuff. Right. So we can print each one of those. Um, and that's what we have done already up, essentially. So that's, that's uninteresting. What is interesting is that you can use um, an operator which we haven't, well, we have discussed, but we haven't used so far, which is instance of to determine whether that uh, instance, that object is actually belongs to a specific class. And why is that helpful? Well, let's say for example that in this case, a snake has, uh, is the only one who, um, the only class that has uh, this um, method that we could call it, uh, let's say, bite someone. And that just does print this thing down. Ouch. Right? Now if we go back if we go back here in inheritance, um, I can use that method only if A is a snake, right? So one thing that I could think of doing here, uh, you know, if I did this, uh, which um, You know, bite someone. It's not even giving it to me, right? Um, the compiler is flagging to me, well, I cannot do this. Why is this happening? The reason is that, uh, well, at, at that stage, the compiler cannot know whether A is, uh, is going to be a snake or not. We have defined an array of animals. We can even change the elements of that arrays, and we, in, in that array, all we know is that there are there are animals. So the only way to make this work is to to take uh, uh, a, and we will have to downcast it to a snake. Um, where I must have defined this name. Oh, yeah, okay. The point is that I haven't done the casting really. Right. That done casting is happening at runtime. Okay? So, at runtime, uh, the runtime will have to figure out whether he can downcast a to, um, to a snake. This, the compiler will not complain um, if I am going here and put it in there, but clearly that at runtime will give me a problem, right? It, it will throw an exception because A, not all the times, is a snake. But there's no way at compile time that we can figure that out. So polymorphism is great, but you need to be also very careful because all downcasting happens at runtime. Last thing that I want to show you is that the opposite case, uh, where instead uh, we are going to look at, um, uh, let's say we do animal here, uh, and let's call it uh, Jess animal. And we are going to cast back 
um, the human, which is called Jess. Okay, so this is uh, instead, which is upcasting, this is done at compile time. So if I try to do something like this, uh, let's say, what do I want? Another, another class, uh, let's say, snake, where? yes. This uh, will not, well, it, it's already showing it there, right? That's not going to work. Because it knows already that Jess is, we know already that Jess is, uh, is, is an animal, and then all the other, um, all, all the other uh, subclasses coming from there. So upcasting is not a problem for the compiler. Uh, it's the downcasting which is the issue, because we are trying to represent something more general um, of uh, the particular type of that object. And that object is in, in reality associated with all of those uh, classes. Okay, that's uh, that's all for today. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, if not, well, you can talk to me later after this. Otherwise, I will see you on Friday. <laughs>